when Mark called me and asked me uh, to fill in for him, he said, uh, you know, you can teach on, uh, if you've got a little promo piece on the RUFI ministry, you, could, you can go ahead and do that. Uh, or if you want, you can go ahead and keep going in Romans. And while I do have a little promo piece on RUFI ministry, I could, I could easily do that. Uh, but I thought, uh, I'd really like to keep going in Romans. Uh, I said, that's fine. Yeah, do what you want. Um, so I, I would hope that there is another time where I could come and speak about the RUFI ministry. Because it, it really is exciting. God is doing some amazing things. Uh, you know, Paul wanted to go to Rome to take the gospel there. We just have to go two blocks in that direction. And we have the world right there at our back door. Um, we have uh, friendships, relationships with people from literally all over the world, most of whom who have never opened the scriptures uh, and heard the gospel, uh, read what the Bible teaches. And so uh, that's one of the things we try to do is um, create an environment where they are free to ask their questions, uh, kind of non-threatening, low pressure. Uh, we, that's what we do at the Global Cafe on Tuesday nights. We have a dinner, and then we have a very uh, easy Bible discussion. During that Bible discussion, there's quite a few people from First Pres who participate and serve as volunteers. So uh, it's, a, it's a great opportunity, uh, and God is at work. We have seen, honestly, we have seen more fruit uh, in the last several years than we ever saw overseas. Uh, it's just phenomenal. Uh, to God be the glory. But today, um, and I'm hoping we'll have more time so I can tell you more about that, but I, um, I really wanted to get into Romans 7. This is something I have to know a little bit about, um, uh, indwelling sin. And, uh, you know, I thought if, if you ever really want to learn something well, try to teach it. Uh, so, uh, we're going to be looking at Romans uh, chapter 7, the last part of it, verses 14 to 25. <clears throat> We've got a long way to go and a short while to get there. So um, what I want to do is kind of give you the overview again, kind of recap it, uh, where we've been. Uh, <clears throat> Romans chapter 3. Paul says, apart from the works of the law, no, no man is justified. We are not justified by doing the works of the law. He goes into uh, then Romans 4. It talks about uh, Abraham, how Abraham was justified by faith before the law was given. It brings us to Romans 5, <clears throat> where he, uh, I rather like John Stott's uh, uh, outline. He says, Romans 5. It's peace with God. Uh, Romans 6, we have union with Christ. And when we get to Romans 7, it's freedom from the law. But as we kind of unpack it a little more, um, Romans 7, is, you can divide it up uh, basically into three sections. There's uh, verses 1 through 6, uh, verses 7 to 13, and then uh, our portion uh verses 14 to 25. In 1 to 6, Paul's explaining how the law no longer has jurisdiction over us. All right? He, he uh, gives us this analogy of husbands and wives. Husbands and wives are bound to each other uh, as long as either of them is alive. Uh, but when death comes to either party, their obligation to each other ends. So in Christ, because of our union with him, when he died, we died. All right? Um, therefore, we've died with respect to the demands of the law. They no longer have any sway over us. But that's not the end of the story. Uh, because of our union with Christ, we now have been bound to another. Romans uh, verse 4, Paul says, Therefore, my brothers, uh, 
you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ, that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we might bear fruit for God. When we were living, to continue with Paul's analogy, uh, when we were living in the flesh, bound to the uncompromising demands of the law, our sinful passions were stoked, okay? They were aroused by the law uh, and bore fruit for death. So then that begs the question, if the law aroused sin in me, which bore fruit for death, is the law then a bad thing? And this is exactly what uh, Paul's uh, opponents are starting to accusing him of. He's saying that uh, you've been freed from the law, you're no longer under the law. Uh, if you've died in Christ, if you're, because of our union with Christ, Romans 6, if he died, you died, therefore you're free from the law. So in the next section, 7 to 13, uh, Paul basically defends the law against the unjust criticism of those who want to be rid of the law altogether. All right? It's uh, sort of that, that libertine uh, attitude, the antinomianism. If, if you're no longer under the law, if you have died to the law, then you can do whatever you want. Paul says, absolutely not. Uh, what, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Paul's response is an emphatic no. He says, I would not have known, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known about coveting. If the law had not said, you shall not covet. Now, chapter 7 um, talks repeatedly about the law. And Mark mentioned this uh, last week. There's, there's the law, the law of God, capital L, and then law uh, with a little l, sort of a governing principle. And we'll get to that in verses 14 to 25. But I thought it'd be really helpful uh, to ask the question, what then is the purpose of the law? Uh, <clears throat> you know, um, Luther said the basic function of the law was to lead us to Christ. The basic function of the law was to lead us to Christ. But Calvin went a little bit further. Um, he said there's actually three functions of the law, three uses of the law. The first function of the law is to reveal the character of God. The moral law of God is not an abstract list of do's and don'ts. Uh, God has the right to say, uh, you shall do this, you shall not do this. We have to remember whose law it is. It's the law of God. God is the one who is making these obligations, and it's his right to do so. We are not free to do whatever we please. Um, as the author of human life and the creator of our souls, God has every right to impose upon us whatever obligation he chooses. So the first function of the law is that it reveals and expresses the character of God. These, the, the moral law of God flows out of his own character. It is who he is. So the law reveals the character of God. In it, we see what holiness is. And that's not all. We're still on the first function of the law. In the light of that holiness, we now see the dirt on our faces. As Calvin says, the spots on our face. We see our own sin. Um, think of... Um, so. <clears throat> One of the things we, we do with uh, the RUFI ministry is we, we take students, we try to get them off campus, do something fun, spend time with them, uh, which kind of cultivates the relationship. Um, so this past Saturday, not yesterday, but a week ago, uh, we took 16 of us, went skiing for the day. And uh, <clears throat> it was fine. My, my prayer through the whole thing was, uh, Lord, please don't let anybody get hurt. Um, everything was fine. Uh, until the end where we lost a young man from Bangladesh for about three hours. Um, he, uh, he was last seen at about 3.30. Here it was, 6.30 or so. We were ready to go. Where's, uh, where's our friend? 
Uh, all I could think of was he is face down in the snow, his phone is broken out of his pocket, and his leg is like this. You know, I, um, thankfully, it wasn't. We found him. But in that scenario, if you've got a broken leg, all right, and you can't tell that it's broken visibly, what do you do? You go get an x-ray. All right, The x-ray will show you what you can't see by the eye. It will show you that the bone is indeed broken. Now, what do physicians do? What does the x-ray tech do? OK, we got the x-ray done. Be warm and be filled. See ya. No. Uh, you then have got to get the, the leg repaired. But the x-ray, the thing that shows you what was there, has no power to heal. It doesn't do anything. All it does is reveal what's there. Okay, That's the first use of the law. Uh, it either leads us to despair or it drives us to Christ. The second use of the law is as a res restraint upon sin. Now, it serves to control, uh, as a control over those who have no concern for just or right behavior unless there's the fear of punishment. Um, <clears throat> I spent a lot of time on Interstate 95. My, my mom still lives in Florida, so once a month I try to get down there to visit her. Interstate 95, <clears throat> uh, the 95 is not the speed limit, uh, but you would think that it is. The speed limit is very clearly posted. It's 70 miles an hour. That's the speed limit. Now, if you drive 70 miles an hour on Interstate 95, you're going to get run over. Uh, everybody goes 75, 80, 85, 95, and much higher. We've all been there. That is until you're on I-95, and then there's a clump, a whole pack of cars. If you're patient and kind of work your way to the front of that pack, what you'll find is Right over there in the middle lane or the far right-hand lane is a police cruiser traveling right about the speed limit. Nobody wants to pass him. Second use of the law, right there. Nobody wants to get caught. Right? It comes out of no sense of justice or righteousness. They just don't want to pay the ticket. Um, that's the second use of the law. The third use, well, and one other thing, too, while I was, um, and Mark may kill me for doing this. I, I hope not. But um, in talking about the second use of the law, it is so much better than having no law at all. And as I was thinking about this, I got, I got to thinking about John Lennon. You all know the song Imagine, right? Um, this is the part that might be hateful uh, for Mark, but... <clears throat> If have you ever actually sat down and listened to those words? Imagine there's no heaven. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us, above us only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. Imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for, and no religion too. Imagine all the people living life in peace. Imagine no possessions. Uh, I wonder if you can, no need for greed or hunger, a brotherhood of man. Imagine all the people sharing all the world. You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will live as one. Friends, that is absolute gobbledygook. That's just ridiculous. Who wants to live in that kind of world? You wouldn't have this utopian bliss. And in fact, uh, when, I, when I did a search on those words, the pages that came up were all these hearts with the words filled into it. Yuck. I, this isn't utopia. This is anarchy. You take away the second use of the law, and you've got nothing but people doing whatever their sinful hearts want to do. All right? This is why no government is so much worse than bad government. The result would be anarchy. And as much as we may not like it, the law still exercises some restraint on us. And as sinful as we are, we would be even more sinful 
that those restraints were removed. That's the second use of the law. The third function of the law is that it tells us what's pleasing to God. And, and Calvin referred to this as the, the principal use or its proper purpose. And it refers to believers in whose hearts God's spirit already reigns. He gives the example of a, of a servant whose inclination is already uh, for the master, the person that he serves. He wants to serve him. He wants to do well. So by observing closely the master, he learns how better to serve, how better to accommodate himself in his service to his master. Um, this, is, uh, this is what I think uh, David speaks of in Psalm 19 when he, when he talks about the law. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise is simple. The precepts of the Lord uh, are clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold, yes, much than fine gold. Sweeter also than the honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, them, moreover by them thy servant is warned. And in keeping them there is great reward. That's the third use, uh, third function of the law. So in Romans chapter 7, when Paul says, what shall we say? Is the law sin? Absolutely not. Uh, I would not have known sin if the law had not said, you shall not covet. That's the first use of the law. It's acting like a mirror. Uh, Paul is saying we need to keep in front of us a clear distinction between the righteousness of the law and our sinful response to it. The law is not the culprit. It's, uh, the law is not at fault. Uh, it's our sinful nature. There's nothing wrong in the law itself. But what happens? Sin, seizing an opportunity, takes advantage of the law. <clears throat> you know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, wet paint sign. Do not touch. It's the first thing, well, for me, it's the first thing I try to do. Uh, maybe you're further along in the sanctification process. Um, anytime there is a prohibition, there's this reflex action within us that wants to challenge that. The prohibition gives the opportunity for us to sin. Um, I was thinking about this. Um, let me see if I can hope I can find it. Yeah. <laughs> Think back to the Garden of Eden. Now I'm going to go out on a limb here. I'm not. I, I've not read this anywhere, so I may be on shaky ground. Mark can correct it next week. Um, think back to the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve are there in an absolute sinless state. Okay, sin has not yet entered into the garden. How long did they live there in that sinless state? We don't know. Um, we know that they could eat of any tree in the garden. Um, the only one they could not eat from was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil right in the midst of the garden. That's the prohibition. That's the law. In their sinless state, did that prohibition, that commandment, bother them in their sinlessness? I, I'm inclined to think, no, it didn't. There wasn't that sinful reaction. They could have lived there quite a long time. It wasn't until Satan comes in, distorts the word of God, casts doubt on the character of God, hey, he's withholding on you. You need this. You need to eat this. You'll see. That's when, sin, that's when their, their choice is made. They choose it because they want it, and sin enters in. And from then on, Anytime there's a prohibition, the reaction in us is sin is aroused, sin is awakened. 
So Paul, um, Paul concludes this middle section, 7 to 13, by saying uh, the law, in fact, is holy. The commandment is good, is holy, righteous, and good. Sometimes when, when you're reading Paul, you have to establish kind of a base camp. Um, Sinclair Ferguson talked about this in Preaching Through Romans. You, you have to set up, uh, okay, uh, I know where I am. The law, you drive a stake in the ground and say, okay, the law is holy, righteous, and good. All right, that we know. If that's true, the question follows on in verse 13. Did that which is good be caused death for me? Okay. If this good thing, holy, righteous, and good, did this cause my death? Is the law a killer then? Okay, that brings us into our passage uh, today. This is where Paul describes the inner conflict uh, that takes place within us. And <clears throat> Uh, right about now, I'm kind of wishing I had spent the hours speaking about RUFI ministry because uh, <laughs> uh, this, this is a difficult passage. Um, in fact, um, I was reading a commentary by R.C. Sproul, and he, he said this is one of the most controversial sections in the book of Romans. He says that had it not uh, had the, the teaching on predestination in Romans 9 not be so clear and so clear clear to grasp, this part, this part of Romans 7 would be the most controversial. Why is it so controversial? <clears throat> it all comes down to whether or not we understand Paul to be talking about his current state as a believer or as an unbeliever. There are quite a few theologians, some of, some of my favorite theologians, uh, who come down on the side, Paul was speaking of his unconverted state. He sees the sin in him. He's not regenerate yet. All, of that, all the things that he says in Romans 7 to 14 are applied to him as an unbeliever. <clears throat> but I think the evidence is actually there in favor of saying, no, he is a believer. Um, even Augustine uh, initially said that, nope, this refers to Paul at, in a state uh, apart from Christ. This is Paul in the flesh. But it is interesting that with time and greater experience, probably more experience perhaps of his own sin, Augustine, even Augustine, changed his view and said, no, he concluded, this is Paul as a believer. Verses, four, verses 14 to 25, Paul is in Christ. And it matters because if you're honest with yourself about your own sin, this is not just Paul's experience. This is my experience. I wrestle with sin. If this is Paul as an unbeliever, then I've got serious problems. But if it's Paul as a believer, then it tells me what's happening to me uh, is not an aberration. This is normal. Uh, this is part of the war within. Now, what's the evidence for saying that Paul is a believer? It's really interesting. Uh, I've got this uh, computer program that allows me, this Bible program that allows me to uh, highlight the verb tenses. Verses 1 to 13, the majority of those verses are in the past tense. They're talking about what was, okay? But as soon as you get into verse 14, and from 14 to the end, the verb tenses dramatically change to the present tense. Paul is speaking now. This is my experience right now. And this is not Paul the immature believer. This is Paul the apostle. This is Paul, the, the, the missionary, Paul, the church planter. Paul is saying, this is my experience right now. 
There's also a change in the situation. In, in, in verses 7 to 13, uh, Paul talks about sin killing him. Uh, he says literally, I died. So he's dead. But in verse 14 and on, Paul describes the ongoing struggle with sin, one in which Paul himself is very much alive. He's not only alive, he's also wrestling with it. He refuses to surrender. It tells me that this is dealing with somebody who is very much alive. Paul also, in verse 22, says he delights in God's law. I delight in in the law of God in my inner being. He delights in God's law, even though sin is nevertheless at work in him. Now, non-believers, non-Christians, cannot delight in God's law. Next week, we get into Romans 8, uh, verse 7, Paul will say, the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. It does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. The ESV says, indeed, it cannot. This is a strong argument uh, for in favor of saying Paul is a believer. Uh, believe, uh, unbelievers do not, nor can they, delight in the law of God. Last thing, uh, Paul admits that he's a lost sinner. In verse 18, Paul writes, For I know that nothing good in, dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For the sin I desire to do, for, for I... Let me start over. Verse 18, For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. Unbelievers are completely unaware that they're lost. Uh, in fact, even immature believers tend to over, be overconfident and unaware of the depths of their own depravity. So uh, I, I hope you are convinced that when we're looking at Romans 7, uh, 14 to the end, we're talking about Paul the believer. I probably should have started by simply reading the passage. So. Uh, verse 14 for we know that the law is spiritual but I am of flesh sold into bondage to sin for that which I am doing I do not understand for I am not practicing what I would like to do but I am doing the very thing I hate but if I do the very thing I do not wish to do I agree with the law confessing that it is good so now no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which indwells me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For the wishing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I wish, I do not do. But I practice the very evil that I do not wish. But if I am doing the very thing I do not wish, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin dwells in me. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wishes to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body, this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, on the one hand, I myself, with my mind, am serving the law of God, but on the other, with my flesh, the law of sin. Um, let me very briefly try to unpack some of this. It, 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 it seems fairly clear. Um, verse 14, Paul says, uh, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am flesh, sold into bondage to sin. The contrast that Paul's making here is between the law, which is spiritual, and himself, which is of the flesh. Paul's not saying, I'm in the flesh, 
or controlled by the flesh, to be in the flesh then would be to be a non-believer. All right? But to be of the flesh, on the other hand, is to be the opposite of what the law is. The law is spiritual. The law is from God. The law is divine. The law is holy, righteous, and good. All right? That's, we've planted our flag there. But I am the opposite of that. I'm of the flesh. I'm earthly. I'm not spiritual. I'm not holy. If you need any evidence that such a person can say those things and still be a believer, um, just take a quick look at 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. You don't have to go there. I've, um, Paul writes to the, to the Corinthians, I could not speak to you, brothers, as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to babes in Christ. And then in verse 3, he goes on, um, for you are still fleshly. These are not unbelievers. Remember, chapter 1, verse 1, he calls them saints. These are believers. And yet, Paul calls them, you're still fleshly. You're men of flesh. What about this expression, sold, uh, sold under sin? All right, kind of confusing. Um, I thought when Christ died, I died. Um, I'm free from the law, and yet now I'm sold under sin. It's very interesting. Um, grammar is important. Uh, the voice of this verb is in the passive voice. Paul's not saying, I have sold myself into sin. Um, he's not given himself over to sin. Uh, there's an unknown or unidentified agent. I am sold to sin. Um, this is uh, somewhat like David in Psalm 51, where he says, I was brought forth in iniquity. Uh, I was born into iniquity. Um, that's the sense of, of Paul being um, sold to sin. Verse 17, so now I am, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin dwells in me. Uh, I don't know if you, you pick this up in reading this section, but you almost get the sense that Paul is disavowing any responsibility for sin. It's, it's not me doing it. Well, what is it? It is interesting. Paul's very clear to say, it is sin dwelling in me. Okay, it's, this is not the... Uh, this is not the old Flip Wilson routine, the devil made me do it. Um, no. Uh, it is sin, and it is sin in my body. All right. Uh, one of the commentators I read says uh, it's, like a, um, it's like a squatter um, uh, who's not a total stranger, but it's Paul's own sinful nature. It's like a wicked intruder, a squatter who is who is there, present, but desperately unwanted. You can't get rid of them. Uh, they're always there. Now, just briefly, uh, verses 18 to 20, if you'll notice, verses 18 and 20 parallel or basically restate what Paul said in 14 to 17. He's saying essentially the exact same thing. Um, and Paul very clearly lays the blame for the sin that he sees in him uh, at his sinful nature. It is sin dwelling in me. All right, the last section, verses 21 to 25. Paul then summarizes his thoughts about this struggle. He's, he calls it a law, but it, it's, um, it's not the law in, in terms of the capital L. This is law with a little l. It's more like a uh, founding principle, a governing principle. There is this principle taking place within him. He joyfully agrees with the law of God in the inner man that's in his innermost being. That's the part that's alive in Christ. But he sees a different principle, different law taking place in the members. That's in his body. The law of sin wages war against the law of the mind. I find it fascinating that Paul does not identify with the body. He identifies uh, with the one who wants to do right. Uh, you could almost say that that is Paul's true sense. 
Okay? That's who Paul really is. The one who wants to do what is right. That's his true identity. It's, it's almost as though he, he takes no ownership of the other identity. But he does recognize it's in him. It's in Paul himself. This conflict is so intense, so ongoing, so relentless, uh, that Paul cries out, wretched man that I am. Um, now, thankfully, Paul gives us the answer to his own question. Who can save me from the body of this death? He knows exactly who can save him. It's God, and he knows exactly how. It is through Jesus Christ our Lord. But even after proclaiming the answer to his dilemma, and the answer to our dilemma, he still states, so then on the one hand, I myself, with my mind, I'm serving the law of God. But on the other, with my flesh, I'm serving the law of sin. When we sin, we sin because we want to. We are not robots. Uh, nobody's making us do anything. The sad reality is that we're choosing beings. All behavior arises out of a choice, a desire. And our desires are either for God or for our own pleasure. There's only two options here. When we sin, we sin because we want to. We know what Jesus has done for us, and we love him. We desire to live for him. And yet, there are times when we want what we want. And so we still end up choosing sin. That's why sin is so hideous. Look at what it does. We know better. We know better. And yet we still do it. The fact that Paul is a believer, Paul is in Christ, gives me great encouragement. Um, if Paul struggles this way, I know that what's happening in me is not some strange thing. This is normal. This is the Christian life. Two things, then we'll close. You'll notice that in chapter 7, there's something conspicuously absent. There is no mention of the Holy Spirit. None at all. And this is what chapter 8 will begin to open up. The Spirit is mentioned in almost every verse. Um, that is the key to our, our victory, if you will. Um, but let's not have any talk about sinless perfection. This, uh, you know, the victorious Christian life. Uh, yes, there is victory, um, but not always. What do you do then when you come face to face with your wicked, sinful choices? I do not want to leave you in this um, state of wretchedness. So I, I wanted to, I wanted to close. Um, I came across this book. I don't know. Somebody sent it to me. Um, it's Extravagant Grace by Barbara Duguid. What she does is basically uh, she interacts with the writings of John Newton. And uh, let me read this section to you, and I, I hope it will be uh, some encouragement to us. If you think that because God hates sin, he must be frustrated and disappointed in you every time you sin, then you will be discouraged in this phase of your Christian growth. Perhaps that's where you are as you read this. You expect much better of yourself as a Christian, and you're sure that God does too. You find yourself sinning a great deal, even when you tried your hardest not to. And she counsels with a lot of people, talks about this is uh, one of the most frequent things she runs up against in her, in her counseling. Uh, these people are confused and undone by the ongoing struggle and their lack of progress in holiness. And they fear that in consequence, God will give up on them. However, if you believe that God is completely sovereign over your sin, 
and is always using it for your own good to teach you more about yourself and more of his grace. Then you are free to hate your sin, but love what God is doing through it. This does not lead to discouragement, fear, anxiety, and depression. On the contrary, it leads to peace, joy, and greater confidence in the work of the Holy Spirit living in you. As Newton observed, every day draws forth some new corruption, which before was little observed, or at least discovers it in a stronger light than before. Thus, by degrees, we are weaned from leaning on any supposed wisdom, power, or goodness in themselves. They feel the truth of our Lord's words. Without me, you can do nothing. If the goal of sanctification is actually growing in humility and greater dependence on Christ, then the Holy Spirit is doing an excellent job. Through his ongoing struggles with indwelling sin, the maturing believer will spend many years learning that he is more sinful than he ever imagined in order to discover that he is indeed far more loved than he ever dared hope. Friends, let that be an encouragement to you. Um, God is not frustrated with you in your struggle to sin. Uh, it's there for a reason. It may be there for you to give up uh, confidence in your flesh, in your strength, in your own abilities to defeat sin, and to cast yourself unreservedly, wholly, completely on what Christ will do in you through his spirit. Let's pray. Father, we, uh, we thank you for Paul. We thank you for this letter to the Romans. We thank you for um, uh, what you are teaching us about indwelling sin. Father, we, um, we pray that your people would be comforted and encouraged um, and draw more and more upon the infinite resources we have in Christ through your spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.